Hi, I'm Bill Hurd. And I'm Fran Blanche. And we're the Dinosaur Den. It's number four, oh, baby. Yeah. And they said it wouldn't last. Well, they said dinosaurs wouldn't go extinct either. And Look well, out, Comet! Well, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm afraid of comets, people. I don't know. I said they said it wouldn't last. So. A layer of iridium <laughs> on our tombstone. Yeah, so, so. yeah. But you might be a dinosaur, too, if you're watching this. I, I suspect you are if you're watching this, because why else would you be watching this? There might be. Well, Morbid I, curiosity. Yeah, we're hoping that maybe non-dinosaurs and dinosaurs alike would like the show. You know, maybe there's a little something mm. for everyone, but but I'll, I'll keep doing surface mount then, try and reel them in. We need to have a like we need to have a lithmus test. See, I said lithmus test, so that's probably that's, oh, that's like the puh test <laughs> for, for acid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, my dad used to have one in his uh, chemistry kit. And, yeah. You know, and I the little lithmus paper, and I used to dip them into everything, everything to know to know which ones are acids and which ones are bases. But you but used to be able to get a chemistry set and I, have yeah. it at home and oh. go to the drugstore. We had an Oscos, Oscars, Oscos in Indiana, and they had a whole display, and I could get Pyrex or I could buy copper sulfate or I could just you know. Yeah. No, I used to be able to um, make explosives at home. Well, even when you know, when I was in my teens, I learned that in Europe they had chemists. You know, where you know, the, in Europe they had drugstores where you could still buy chemicals. You know, you can buy yeah. The, I mean, they call it the chemist, and you can actually still buy dry, you know, chemicals. But you know, back in the fifties, sixties, used to be able to do that, and we we had that in my house because my dad uh, he he started out as a chemistry major, so he still had this like yeah. box of stuff. I used to have this box this bottle of mercury you know this yeah, big, we you know, about mercury. big bottle of mercury i used to play with it all the time you know yeah. you pour it out on the i used to go on the back porch you know this big cement slab pour the whole bottle Chase out and roll it around and then roll it all back and put it in the bottle and there was never as much went back in as came out oh yeah well you know you'd be licking your fingers when you eat <laughs> potato chips you know uh, and I didn't ever try it, but you know I heard that the thing to do when you had you know, like a whole lot of mercury is you take your pocket change and you know, take your dimes and nickels, you know the end of the nickel, uh, uh, if it and you sticks to the yeah no you yeah you'd take like a dime or a nickel anything nickel a nickel coated coin, dip it in the mercury, and then pull it out and it'd be like mirror shiny because yep. it would um, like you know a molecular layer of mercury would adhere to the nickel. I guess it's ion an ionic bond, and uh, and so you know you put that in your pocket and it would stay like mirror shiny, you know. The um, we used to have mercury dimes. You'd mm. find every down and and what it is is somebody did that to a penny. Yeah. And it's like oh penny. You know, so they're trying to make nine cents. Uh -huh. But back then that was like seventeen cents. You know. It's, but yeah, no, I've seen I've seen mercury dimes. So that's so, like a that's so like a high tech slug. Yeah, but picture then too something one that we know is so dangerous to people, and you're, you've exchanged a human's uh, life and health and well-being for nine cents. Well, look look what it did to me. <laughs> do, you, do you walk on your toes? I'm told that's one of the symptoms of mercury poisoning. It's a roller. One. And we're back from a power outage. Yeah, this is actually take two of yeah. starting it up because we had a we had a full on roller. Full power outage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which um, that's how the dinosaurs lived. They they didn't have electricity. I don't I don't know if that's common knowledge or not. Yeah, uh, that, it's in, it's probably uh, implied that they didn't have electricity. Yeah. But if they did, it would always be going out. That would. That yeah. Would, yeah. Yeah. They they the, the, just the conditions for infrastructure didn't exist really well. You know, in watching Gilligan's Island, see, that's how you tell your uh, <laughs> dinosaurs. You actually saw the when Gilligan's Island was new. Right? Mm -hmm. They they always did the pedal uh, pedal generators and stuff to power the radio. Well, the professor had all kinds of things. You know, he, I, he had a TV one time at a, like I guess. Like, he was stirring coconuts. You remember that one? You you had mentioned that one before. I I'm really fuzzy on Gilligan's Island because it's well I I guess having like crisp crisp memory of Gilligan's Island would be sadder <laughs> than having fuzzy sad. memory. Just but, uh, sad. 
Well, one of the things then we were talking about with the power outage is oh, yeah. uh, we start talking about eating without electricity, and I grabbed my old sea ration cans. This one's seen better days. <laughs> you wanted to eat it, though. I said, I don't well, think no, it's see, edible. You, you don't eat your last sea ration. This is uh, You definitely don't want to eat that beef one. Beef slices and potatoes. <laughs> this is the best sea rations ever. Oh, God. And That's we used to so get these things now. that were uh, fruitcake, and it, oh my God, if you threw it at the enemy, you could hurt them. So <laughs> But as I was saying, fruitcake is like, can it can be like, you can preserve fruitcake to eat forever. But and we proved it. <laughs> just stick it in a can. Yeah. You're just part of a government experiment to find out if the, if there was a food that, right, that right. people could they eat perpetually. They might have laced it with, with some kind of... <laughs> some. And you might be a dinosaur too. We're going to have a test today to see if you, you qualify as a dinosaur. Huh? Are we, we're going to have a test? You well, have a test? Just, just little things. Okay. Like if you say printed wiring board PWB, you might be a dinosaur. If you only think in through hole, you might be a dinosaur. Yeah, well, <laughs> and, and we're trying to get you, so at least you do surface mount also. But if you know what a Siamese pento is. Ooh, Siamese pentode. Yeah. That's cool. So, yeah, you had to wait for chips otherwise to combine two like that. That was a cool tube. If so. you yeah, if you if you know how to uh, bias a triode, you might be a dinosaur. Well, I, I I used to do grid leak bias to get my negative eight, just let it drift on down. I'm a big believer in uh, fixed bias. Nailing it down, yeah. <laughs> the uh, did you ever have a Thomas register? I didn't have a Thomas register, but I knew of the Thomas right. register. Right. That was the internet before there was internet. Right. So you yeah. had, you looked in a book. Well, there were you know. There That's were lots. A cat. That that is in that is the orange cat that lives in the lab. Yeah, I know. That's now. This is not Missy. This isn't my cat. This is this is Bill's cat. Bill re rescued kitty. Yeah, and yeah. she likes attention. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and she can make her claws stick to the floor. Yeah, she she did the uh, the Velcro thing. Yeah, they've gone nuts with the whole blue thing. Well, I did a. I think uh, a video about LEDs uh, last year. It's, it's, it's pretty popular, uh, and uh, yeah, the, and the, the last part of it was talking about the evolution of blue and how it really was, uh, you know, how hard it was yeah. to come up with it. And actually, it was only after I did that video that I found out that they um, that they actually, you know, that the um, uh, that those silicon carbide blues were actually invented in the 70s. They actually, you know. Came they, up with it in the seventies. So, so weak and oh no, they were just so hard to make. Yeah, so. and we kept reading about blues coming or how you know how weak or strong they are, and the very first use for them was DVD players. That's where they really wanted a blue to for the wavelength to get it onto the onto the disc and things. Is my understanding for uh, for the laser blue laser? Yeah, CD ROMs. I mean, not DVDs, but CD ROMs. For the wavelength, yeah. right? Yeah. Because well, that well, blue LED. If we didn't have the blue LED, we wouldn't have Blu-rays and DVDs. I mean, it's right. you know, right. it's just that simple. I mean, people don't think about the association between something, a technology like blue LED, and like everything that they depend on. You know, like we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have smartphones. We wouldn't have, and if we didn't have blue LEDs. You know, we, we would have right. never made the res. You know, all these technologies that are built Jumbotrons. around. Well, everything. I mean, we wouldn't have you know little you know monitors. You know, everything. Right. We'd still be doing everything LCD with backlit. Right. So, hey, let's talk about our website a little bit. Okay. We have a bulletin board. Oh, we do. We do. We, we do. Yes, we have oh, a okay. full-blown bulletin board. Wow. And we got some emails since last time we talked. And people were emailing us really cool ideas and what if we could get them to use the bulletin board. Of course, the problem is when you're the first person on a bulletin <laughs> board, you feel like you're standing in an empty room talking to yourself. Yeah. But uh, no, it's franandbill.com. And there's if you register, there's a bulletin board you can use. We can even start some topics. Okay. Are you a dinosaur? Might <laughs> be a good topic. List all the things that... So, oops. Uh -oh. Mike stand there. Oh, that was me. So... Uh, so you, you know why the uh, website's called Fran and Bill instead of like Bill and Fran or Fran and Fran? So I remember a lot of heated discussion about that. Oh, well, <laughs> no, it just it came down to I was raised uh, ladies first, so yeah, it was but politeness. I, yeah, I th I thought that Bill and Fran had a better rhythm. It probably to it. does, but I still raised for <laughs> you know politeness. I, Actually, I have both domains now, so we can 
Run, oh, run both we can. Of them. Oh, okay. Well, we can. Oh, switch. we can make it so that if you come in, Bill and Fran, it'd have like a masculine thing to it, and come in and Fran and Bill, it'd be a little more feminine. <laughs> so, as so I designed the Fran and Bill website, you designed the Bill and Fran yeah, website. Or yeah, yeah. Post headers. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> oh, you've been busy. Uh, I, oh, I got I, a I lot of things. Yeah. I haven't checked things. the website, but uh, I know you were working a lot on it, so. Uh, well, th yeah, it's, it's I'll automated. Have I'll have to check it out. I'll have to check our website out now. Yeah. <laughs> the main thing is it, it'll, as soon as we put the video up, within 30 minutes, the website will, should load it automatically. Mm. So we don't have to do that anymore. Okay. So And we can make pages, you know, load other people's websites, uh, Allen's or somebody's. Cool. So. Oh, yeah. Um, have you worked on any projects as far as stuff you can show? Uh, nothing that I can talk about. Uh, right. Sort of. Uh, well, I got some some little circuit news. The uh, for Hackaday, I did a uh, a show on analog computing, and I used my little op amp models here. Let's see it. And um, <laughs> you can put it under the. Yeah, let's try that. Try the microscope. This actually is better than the microscope. It turns out I can zoom in. Just this is the macro. Well, now we have macro and micro on the. Right. On the uh, bench. So there we go. Oh, well, that's a good macro view. Yeah. A little. All right. So, so I can put it here on the bench, and uh, what I've added is, or what I learned, was that it was too early to go to single voltage. Uh, I, I needed plus or minus volts. We got a little glare. A little there. glare. Yeah. On. And uh, so I made this so you can have a programmable. Um, Ground reference, so it's actually got two op amps. Oh, gonna show it again. Yeah, I just, I just, yeah, we're there you go. <laughs> so there's actually two op amps in there, and one makes a ground reference. So I'm gonna redo all the circuits to have a ground reference. So that'll be cool. And one of your favorite chips. I haven't stuffed this one yet. And that's an AD633 yeah. uh, four quadrant multiplier. Yeah, it's a, it's. And I haven't stuffed that, but you, big you fan know, of that. You, you know what I'm what I'm looking to make is a good voltage controlled filter. And growing up, I never had a good one. They were always like three dB per octave. And did you had some voltage controlled filters in your in uh, your uh, I, pedals, I, right? I, I do. Yeah, the a few of them are voltage controlled. Um, it, it's it's tricky, you know. Um, uh, precision op amps is always the way to go. Just if you go discrete, you, you yeah. You, but you you have to you, you have to still find a frequency dependent component, you know, which is usually in the old days it was you, you know can you get into a variable resistor or a variable capacitance to change the filter? And there's things like, <clears throat> and we may talk about someday the MF10 switched capacitive voltage control filter. I actually want to make a, a one for that. But otherwise, we were using FETs and the twin TRCs of feedbacks and stuff. But that's 3 dB per octave. And really also, well, also, uh, you can also use optics, optocouplers. Mm. I mean, I, I, my um, my compressors are voltage controlled and with optocouplers, so which adds another level of trickiness. So you know what I'd like to do, and maybe this is uh, something we can get bulletin board activity over the next six months. Bulletin board, yeah, dyno bulletin board, baby. dyno. Well, <laughs> uh, because I'm thinking, you know, I. I I grew up with analog synthesizers, and I loved Keith Emerson. Emerson, like and Palmer, knew every note, and that's probably there's a Commodore 128 because of Keith Emerson. Truth, truth be known, I was music and electronics were tied together for me, um, and I assume that uh, electronic music is part of you also. Yeah, I actually I I grew up uh, listening to Jean-Michel Jarre and Vangelis and. Uh, on that kind oh, of stuff. Oh, so. what was Kraftwerk? Remember? Cra well, uh, well, Kraftwerk. What's yeah. that other one? So they were full. They were hard to listen to. Some of them, but they're fully. Uh, we're talking about Kraftwerk now. No, I'm, I'm just I'm jumping around. <laughs> um, switched on Bach, but what Wendy I was Carlos, thinking about yeah, Wendy Carlos was um, making an analog synthesizer modules, but instead of a control voltage, maybe make them be SPI based, a three wire um, um, signal. And so you have a bunch of these, but instead of like zero to one or zero to five to control your filters and stuff, maybe each each one of these little things just has a three wire control on it or something. So something I'm thinking about is how 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 would you do an analog synthesizer these days, 
of course, you know, the old modules were all transistor and they were matched transistors and two in a pack. Right. And then the the setup procedure was ma made or broke the that module, how well it worked. You know, just all the trim the offset, trim the this, trim the low. Well, how can we do it these days without that? And my thought was tree wire and just, you know, calibrate for it and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and in that light, one of the things I'm playing with, I may do this into a video for Hackaday. Move it together. All right, so what I've got is a, and I just I just purchased this. This is a, uh, a Altera development system to run the NIOS processor, and it's, you know, it's USB based. But that plugs into a board by analog devices. And again, I, I once I play with this, I want to make a board out of it. This is a DDS. This is a programmable frequency synthesis. And so what I was thinking about doing was um, programming sine waves to show how you make a square wave with the odd harmonics. And, and then you can have a discussion about, well, when you have a clock, the oscilloscope on it, you know, if it's rounded, it's the high frequency. If it's sagging in the middle, it's the low frequency response. And then even have conversations about the radian frequency, how fast it rises and stuff. So programmable, you know, it's not sampled. You know, everybody's done sampled. But if I could program, you know, a VCO or, or something like that, um, with just a whole bank of this stuff, I think that'd be cool. So that's what I've been playing with. Oh, hey, one more thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I, it's not ready to be turned on, but this is a... Yeah, there, there you go. Look at that. It's quite a monster you got there, Bill. <laughs> yeah, this is based on a Raspberry Pi on the back, and then... A, you know, an off-the-shelf LCD uh, um, uh, LCD display with a push-button encoder and some cool Navtech switches. But this is uh, Terry Ryan who did BASIC for the Commodore 128 and also the TED series. So he wrote he wrote BASIC for version 3.5 and version 7. He's helping me with this. Cool. And we're writing a code. And, and we're, we're looking for applications, but we're starting with just an internet radio. Wow. You know, for this kind of thing. But that is a legacy project. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we'll we'll uh, we'll have to see how well it works. I, I'll never get my money back out. I've spent so much money. We never do. Yeah. We, we never get our money back out of these projects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, so um, uh, there there is a little bit of news. Uh, do the, the we'll do the news title. News. Do you, do you have news? I don't have news. Well, no, the news is about. Uh, uh, well, it was written, they, they wrote about it on Hackaday first, and then I read it in the New York Times about Radio Shack. The Radio Shack, our beloved uh, place of all nerddom, is sort of that going That word under. didn't exist back then, though. It did not. But, um, but apparently, um, the, I mean, Radio Shack has been going under for a long time. Mm -hmm. We've been seeing it. But, uh, but it seems that a lot of the younger DIYers and 20-somethings have that who tinker and hack they have discovered that little corner in the back of the Radio Shack where they have all the little components and stuff that would that used to be like the whole store right you know yeah. and uh, back in back in the day there's like power transistors right or right 7406 I mean, or a CMOS. Back, yeah I mean what you know in the 70s Radio Shacks were larger and they pretty much just sold parts yeah. that was all they had and you used to be able to get like a military uh, surplus stuff because you know they used to sell these big packs where you could, you know, pay a lot less money and just get like a mixed bag of m Arts. military components or whatever. Well, so you know, back in the 70s and the 60s and the 50s, uh, anyone who did anything electronics, Radio Shack is where you went. But in recent decades, they sort of shifted to selling cell phones and. A lot of, and PC. mobile stuff. Fans you know. for your PC that light up. Right. Well, they they're sort of losing their shirts. So it turned out uh, in the article in the New York Times that the uh, Radio Shack is you know it's got like a it's got like a year to live basically uh, without major changes. So I read on Hackaday that like the that there's a movement t for you know people for younger people who now depend on mm -hmm. Radio Shack. To try and save Radio Shack by getting Radio Shack to change itself, right. but get, trying to get them to 
get rid of all the stuff basically that they sell <laughs> in favor of going back to selling parts, you know, and uh, for DIYers, which I think is great. Well, they'd have to really, well, do they do Arduinos now or any they of those? They do. That was one of the changes is that they've actually started selling Arduino, um, mod, you know, the shields right. and, and the various components. And also they're starting to sell FPGA stuff and uh, and various kind of development kits for different kinds right. of, uh, yes. of boards. I, I saw something on Hackaday and it was huge project. I mean, real good math behind it. And then on Arduino, and I'm like, why not use a real processor? <laughs> it's, 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 it's a keyboard control. Oh, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I did. I mean, I did an Arduino uh, yeah, project, I, I got uh, but it, they, they have their place. But they're they're sort of become too much of a catch-all. Yeah. Um, I mean, these days I see a lot of projects where people are using uh, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis for stuff that you could just build out of just discrete parts. And yeah, it just, but it's, like it's it's cool too. Uh, you know, again, the the whole thing about the Arduino was the how easy the um, development. You know, where you you, right. you sit down and you write code and flash it to it. Whereas when I do a design from ground up, it takes me a day to get the IDE set up and talking to the chip, whatever chip I'm using. Well, not only that, but I, I mean, I showed in my uh, Firefly video that the, the, the benefit of the Arduino is uh, over like an FPGA, is you, because as the RAM build in, it's all an, all on one chip. You know, you can literally set up uh, a, a design, load it into the Arduino, unplug it from the board and, and plug it into right. Another board that you have set up just with the clock uh, and your output, and you can run it really autonomously. That's one of the benefits of Arduino, but very few people use it that way. Uh, you know, I think the only benefit to um, the microcontrollers is is their autonomy that you can you can. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, keep, keep yeah, you can program them and then remove them from the development board and put them in a different environment. Right. So what do you got there? Well, I was going to say, and see, I, when I, I don't say Arduino as much as I say ABR, because, you know, there's a whole family right. of them, as sure. everybody knows. Well, um, I'm very specific on Arduino being... Yeah. And my son just built this. Oh. This is the first thing he soldered, really, over cool. the weekend, and Look it's a... Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we have our ABR, and then... We plug in one of the ever-present LED uh, LCD screens, and this is my son's first uh, project soldering. So uh, we debugged it last night, and uh, so maybe this this uh, holiday weekend we'll actually use it and stuff. And cool. It's got like a uh, it's got some decoding, um, serial decoding. It tries to act like a low-speed oscilloscope using the built-in A to D converter. We should do a show about A D converter sometime. Yeah, all the different yeah, kinds, sure, yeah, because uh, there's, um, and uh, and also a logic analyzer. So I actually I wouldn't mind adapting that for use with um, like all the little boards on building stuff. Have a cheap oscilloscope that comes with them mm. somehow. So yeah, me too. Yep, you mentioned Radio Shack. I did, and look at this baby. This Vintage. is my first data book, and you can see it's got Radio Shack printed there, and. This is my second data book, and the cover is gone, but it, it was from Linear, and was, but it was printed for data, uh, for, or it was branded Radio Shack, I should say. <laughs> well, do you think, do you think Radio Shack w would recover? I mean, because the, I don't know. Faced I with DigiKeys and Spark uh, funds and Adafruit. I think, I don't think that, I don't think that they're going to be around too they, long. They, I mean, it, it, they would have to be plugged into the whole maker thing real heavy The or something. problem is retail retail in general is dying because of uh, online buying and um, you know the convenience of buying a component Radio Shack uh, is uh, is offset uh, industry-wide yeah. by the by the price incentive it's of buying online or if they have almost all your parts and you still have to go online to buy a part that's where you're going to place your order sometimes right well but i'm um, that that is a much more recent problem with radio mm. shack i mean in in the old days they used to stock tens of thousands of parts and you you could buy everything there well i had some news just uh, okay quick things I, altera 14.0 released and i don't know what all that means yet but uh, that just dropped and proteus who makes the um the cad that i use yeah, and, and you know I'm not I'm not a big fan of Eagle. Well, put it in mildly. And y if you can't afford the Altium or the Orcads, I, I use Proteus um, 
Ares is the PC board layout and Isis is the schematic. Uh, they just got BSDL support, which means you can go to Altera's website and load the model that um, has all the pins and everything. So you don't have to make the, the model in a way that you'll uh, screw up, because I screw those up a lot. Now, Eagle's had this all along, but the interesting thing about Proteus is I may have had something to do with them adopting the BSD, kind of like that last straw, where they, they knew it was there but didn't think people need it, and then an engineer popped up and said, hey, I'd love to use your program, why don't you have BSDL? So that, that just came out, so that, that's cool. I, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, a matter of fact, I'm working on a 144-pin chip this weekend. Okay. For, um, um, I don't have it out for, for one of the shields, FPGA shield for Arduino-ish things. So, so that's it for me for news. Hey, I'm very <laughs> chipified news. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, the last uh, Dinosaur Den we dedicated to workbench essentials and safety, and so I thought that we would just, in, in our very you know dinosaur form, just completely shift to the other side of the spectrum and talk about some of the tools and processes and, and procedures for doing boards in large quantities, like if you get into production, like right. doing hundreds or thousands of boards. See, I thought you, you were going to say just keep the ball moving in the same direction, but you said shift no, just right, to that's shift all right, the same. Shift yeah. right to the, to the far end, because the, the, you know, there are lots of tutorials where you, that'll teach you how to do, you know, well, there's lots of different kinds of production. S yeah, so and but you can do your own production. You can, and actually, that's you, really you, what you I want to talk about. That. Yeah. Exactly, because um, I was a really big believer in vertical integration. And, and what's that mean? Well, it it was um, I think it was really goes back to Henry Ford, who's who's sort of credited with inventing vertical integration. It used to be said that um, you know in the old uh, Model T factory that they said that coal and iron ore and trees went in one end of the building right. and Model T's came out the other. And so the idea of vertical integration is doing everything in-house as much as, or, or in philosophy, right. doing as much in-house as you can. And there are lots of reasons for it, but in my case, it really was the only way that I can make... A uh, handcrafted. Yeah, it, it was a Where's quality. Where's the word vertical come in, though? Well, the, I think the idea is that vertical integration as opposed to outsourcing is that uh, everything is on one footprint you know, uh, you so height, yeah, yeah floors think of, in your factory, right? The vertical integration. Think of uh, a skyscraper uh, with uh, with every single thing that goes into your product being produced in the same footprint. Mm. Uh, so, um, so in my case, you know, I would uh, machine all the cases. Then I I I had my own paint room, so yeah, I did all I've my own painting. Some of those pictures, done yeah. my own uh, silk screening, um, and also the circuit boards. I'd made my own circuit boards from raw stock. And so, bare copper black, bare copper clad yeah. boards to uh, finish to finish product was all done right at Frantone, and um, uh, no one else really did it that way. You know, I never outsourced for. No, I, for I didn't see people doing stuff. the 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 variety of products you had. Like uh, you might have seen somebody doing a a widget back then, but never the. Well, other people. There were other people who are, had large product lines but what they also had that I didn't have is a lot of capital right. because the amount of money that you have to have behind having like a dozen products uh, um, for the competition versus what I had to put into it was it was orders of magnitude right. so th the advantage of vertical integration doing it all yourself and this is what's uh, really pertinent for the modern DIYers because a lot of people do Kickstarter and crowdfunding and so you there are a lot of people who find themselves in the position of doing mass production and never made anything before, yeah, yeah. and there and so people discover this whole vertical integration thing by accident because they just realize that well, if I outsource everything I need to do for this I can project, make yeah. I well yeah oh, if I, yeah if, if I outsource, outsource it, it's if I outsource just a money everything equation. yeah I'm going to actually owe money into this <laughs> just to get the uh, just to get the quota met or if we've had a way of doing everything in here uh, everything uh, rather than paying everyone else to do all the tiny little parts and putting it together well then we'd actually have a profit and it was really it was really a matter of profit margin and right. also quality control so in the process of that i came up with a lot of tools and a lot of ways of doing things myself uh that i thought i'd show okay that's cool oh, yeah. It, we had several start. We had a power outage here at the lab. We're in Jersey. It's the Labor Day weekend, and we had a, 
a full-on power outage for about it's, half an hour. It's never a holiday in <laughs> Jersey because you wake up and it's still New Jersey. So, uh, so our first attempt at this was, was pretty much the files. I think is corrupted. It went completely dark. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, um, uh, yeah, this is. Our here, let me give you some room. This is uh, I'll put this here under the. Where's our little clicker here for the switcher thing or switcher? Oh, okay. Okay, there we go. So this is uh, an example of a, this is a 4x6 um, single-sided FR4 board that uh, has been etched. This is the way that um, a board would come out of the etching tank and it's still got the uh, the mask on it. That's the dark here. What did you make your resist out of? Uh, well, actually, uh, this is um, this is press and peel, which is actually, oh. go, to the, go to the wide shot. Oh, okay, yeah. so it's this stuff. This is uh, press and peel blue. Um, I used to use uh, a, um, a chemical, an optical chemical process using a positive photoresist, and I had a UV exposure tank, and I used to use a transparency uh, with a photographic, you know, right. a, um, con it. contact printer, you know, from you know, piece of glass, you know, it's under pressure, and then exposed with UV. But this is uh, this is the more modern method. This is the way that people would really want to do it today. This is a uh, this is a press and peel blue. It's it's basically a coated mylar sheet. It's got this blue paint coating, which peels off, and uh, on uh, you put this through a regular um, laser printer, and uh, using the right kind of toner. I actually had to experiment uh, to get. I, uh, the right kind of printer and the right kind of toner. Yeah, and I found work. I found that the absolute cheapest HP printer that I could buy and the absolute cheapest toner I could buy actually works out the best. <laughs> <laughs> and you set the density really high. And so um, it's basically, you know, the toner is like a plastic layer that gets printed onto this sheet. And then you thermally transfer this. This is upside down and backwards. You thermally transfer it to the copper. In heat press, which I've demonstrated right. in another video, and it's video. all done at one to one. There's no it's one to no one, two to exactly. one, or anything. And then um, you etch it out. I, th this was actually etched in my etching tank, and I use a sodium persulfate solution. Now, the ultraviolet light is—is is there any difference between just well, back growing up, we all had black lights. Was it just a black light, or was it shorter uh, frequency? It's 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 a it's a uh, it's a it's a more um, far wave. Uh, UV. I think that it's a quartz. Uh, mm. It's 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 the more dangerous UV. Okay. It's, it's, yeah, it has it's, a little pink it's a, tinge yeah, to it. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's um yeah it's the more dangerous my, UV. My dad brought one of those home from RCA, and they used to use it checking the phosphorus actually in this Right. Tank. Yeah. And it's then you look great. at it, and you realize your eyes hurt. You know. Yeah. It's it's uh, extremely dangerous stuff. Yeah. Uh, but actually, the 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 UV exposure tank I made is completely sealed. So you only turn it on after you right. close it up, but it's it's completely so, you know um, light tight. Um, and but um, the photo resist method you can still do it. They there are still companies that sell positive yeah. and negative uh, resist uh, you know um, boards are already at, you know, activated. Already activated. Yeah, yeah. you just That's, have to. I think I would do something like yeah. that if I were. But there, there are it is the chemical process is problematic. You know uh, I I found it was problematic because just in shipping the boards if you're buying sensitized boards mm -hmm. you know just in shipping the you know whether Scraping and stuff no too. no uh, the heat and such will change you know uh, depending on when they were sensitized right. how mm -hmm. long they're in shipping whether they got x-rayed you know because <laughs> I because sometimes parcels get x-rayed and you'll I I've, I ended up with lots of boards that uh, were sensitized so and, and partially exposed, exposed because they've been x-rayed um, if they get hot in a truck right. you know it, the, it'll sort of ruin so there are lots of variables gotcha. that you eliminate so you so by doing this. your own sensitive or your own uh, sensitizing if you do your if you make it up yourself with uh, with the chemistry and everything you can eliminate those variables but then there are other variables of exposure temperature you know when you're doing the developing you have to have you have to act like a chemist then at you that have point. to be a chemist because you have to have rigid control not only over your exposure times and such but also the temperature uh, and the mixtures when you're doing your developing it's just like doing photography right, you know, right. doing chemical photography so the easiest way and the most modern way is doing this sort of heat transfer method. But as I showed in my video before, that you really need an industrial heat press to, to really do it. Um, but this one was done with that process, and uh, that's actually 
the, the toner, it's still on it. After, uh, and you can store it that way for a long now, time. Did you ever do one with a, a Sharpie? Did you ever use the, um, the kind of the drawable or yeah, the tape? The, yeah, the problem with those is they, they really don't last in an etching solution. No, they don't. Uh, that's know? the problem I always had was yeah. they have scratches or something. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can try using it for touch-up, but even if you put several layers of, yeah. of indelible marker, it will come out. In well, the, in I put it upside down one time, and had, actually <laughs> I had a kid in my electronics class agitate it for me all class, and we turned it over and it was just a blank board because mm -hmm. it scraped it all off, and then dissolved it it's gonna, okay all right this is a this is one that's been cut out this is the the bare board um, with the toner still on it and this is one that's been uh, cut out and cleaned so there's no more resist but it's undrilled you see there's no no holes in it uh, and this is the way that uh, the boards would be uh, in a state of just being in stock uh, and then I would keep them undrilled like this until I needed to do a run, uh, and then I'd drill and fill. Uh, and to drill became another. Oh, we're back. Drilling um, is another issue because if you're just doing one board, one printed circuit board, you can drill out a board in 10 minutes or something. Yeah. But if you're doing a hundred of them, you will spend your entire life drilling circuit boards. So or um, breaking drill bits. Both. So I had to come up with a way of doing um, hundreds of boards a week uh, by hand, and that's when I came up with the die method. And this is this is a, uh, a die right here. Let's take a look. let's zoom in on that. <laughs> zoom in. There you go. All right, there we go. So I came up with this. This is a drill die. Um, it's a quarter-inch thick piece of. Uh, it's like a T4 aluminum, T3 aluminum base, uh, and um, several layers to it. Um, the idea was to have a way of re having a stack of boards and register and drilling them all at once uh, accurately. And the solution was the die. Okay, so you can see there's uh, there's the register. You can drill, zoom in a little more. Yes, yeah, just. <laughs> uh, I zoomed out while it was your there hands. There we go. Oh, okay. It's kind of fun. There we go. So that's the drill register. Uh, several is, different. Is the B for Blanche or <laughs> is that? No, the B is for uh, Brooklyn. It's a Brooklyn board. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I marked uh, what uh, board it was supposed to be, and this uh, brass top sheet. That's actually the drill register for all the holes that should be in the board. Uh, and the, the, the copper uh, brass plate, sorry, this brass plate um, acts as the guide to start the drill going through the FR4 board, which is, you know, okay. uh, really um, soft uh, underneath. And um, so, oof. <laughs> now, now, was it easy to tell if you had missed a, a drill? Ah, well, that's part of the process. You see, the, what I would do is I switch to the other, uh, yeah. Okay, there you go. So you can see the various size of the holes, and those are actually oversized, so um, they act as a reservoir so that um, as the drill bit passes through the stack, it has somewhere like to go. Scarf. Well, yeah. it has to go into the recess, because I, I drill with uh, tungsten carbide bits, and high-speed tungsten carbide bits are extremely fragile. They're very hard. Right. You know, they drill through glass, but they're very brittle. So if you, um, if you hit something hard, like aluminum, uh, suddenly, it'll you know it'll seize up the bit and it'll just shatter. Yeah. And I never thought of aluminum as hard. Well, it, I the, mean you know stock aluminum. The difference is when you're going through a stack of FR4 boards into and you hit something hard, it will seize up the bit because you know the bit's heating up. It's going through, right. so you you have to be careful with changes in hardness. When you're drilling through something hard like aluminum, you're going at a very slow speed, applying very little pressure. Uh, FR4 board. When I'm doing these, you know, you're plunging really oh, fast. Oh yeah, compared. To, I, right, I right. forgot it compared to the board. Exactly. Right, right. So um, those those recesses in the die are meant to uh, be areas where the drill bit can actually just pass into, and you set the stop on the drill press so that the bit won't actually bottom out. It'll end up in that uh, big hole in the back, and the um, the drill guide in the front. Uh, with front registers, those holes are 
actual size. So they're the same size as the drill bit minus, right. you know, a half Fair a thousandth of an inch, right? right? Um, and so um, the brass uh, allows you to center the bit, and then once it's once it starts to go in the hole, uh, you can just plunge through the whole stack really fast. And you can do like like eight or nine boards at a time. Um, what I did here um, is uh, there are registration pins here, these pins, and so there are four um, holes on every board that have to be drilled out um, to go into the registration pins. So if you're doing you know, like eight boards, nine boards at a time, you drill out those four holes and then um, stack up the raw boards and then uh, in order to be able to know what you drill and what you don't drill, you put a, a sheet of thin white paper, white paper? on the okay. top. So when you put the the top, the, the brass register on the top, you can see uh, just by looking at the top of the die which holes have been drilled, which holes cool. are not drilled. And uh, you know, this uh, die system allowed me to drill out boards. You know, I, I could do a uh, uh, hundred boards in wow. a few hours. So um, it really changed the game, uh, but you have to be creative and come up with um, tools like this to, right. to do anything and, in and still then be willing to sit there and do it continuously and try and keep your mind on it. Right. Well, there, there's you know a lot involved with drilling right. boards, and number one is uh, FR four dust is really toxic. You, you can't breathe Never it. Never even thought of it's, that. Uh, it's um, uh, people don't realize. Well, it. yeah, it, 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 it's, it's physically talk, talk to you. It's glass. It's glass, but it's right. a, it's also uh, fibrous because right. the, the the fibers in FR four board are very Th that, small. That very I would fine. have thought of. I did. Right. Yeah. So um, the you can not only can you get silicosis because the FR uh, the FR four if you inhale FR four dust deeply in the lungs it'll right. it'll tend to stay there so um, you can if you're constantly exposed to it you can get silicosis but also um, it was shown in industrial accidents that FR4 dust or fiberglass fine ground fiberglass dust can actually cause cardiopulmonary edema like if you in right. inhale it the shock of inhaling it can actually cause your you know your heart it, to swell and you can actually die like within right. hours or or the the, tra the area where the uh, blood and oxygen Transfuse or infuse, whichever the word, that get clogged with this material. Right? Uh, well, you you would yeah. have to like have your face in a pi in a pile of it. But no, the um, the the uh, cardiopulmonary edema occurs because of the shock, uh, the irritation shock of, of oh, so it, okay, it's a histemic reaction. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, but um, so you have to wear, you know, um, full protection. You know, you have to have a respirator when you're drilling. Mm -hmm. And also, I I created a drilling environment, a drilling station, which I showed in one of my old videos, where um, I had a, a hood. You know, I have a HEPA filter, a, a big HEPA filter, and a hood built around it with the drill press in it, so it creates this laminar flow of air right. around me when I'm drilling. And also, it takes all the dust and arrests it, so, yeah. so it's not in the environment. So it constantly keeps the dust out of the air. Because not only you need to have something like that if you're drilling circuit boards, because it's not just about when you're working. If you're wearing a respirator, but you don't have any way of taking the dust out of the right. air, and then take the respirator, take the respirator off, and it's and you then know, sweep the floor. Exactly. Yeah. So you have to have uh, control over dust if you're drilling FR4 boards. Gotcha. But, um, we but had we had one rule, and that was don't drink and drill. <laughs> so. You got to have your hair back. Put your hair back uh, if you're drilling. You know, that happened to me. I had long hair. Yeah. Oh. I, uh, ninth grade um, machine shop, and I, I was drilling, and I leaned, and it uh, grabbed a tuft of hair. Mm. And pulled. It was the bang of hitting my head on the drill press, because it, 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 it compression loaded my head. That's uh, it's, it's no joke. A lot of people die. I mean, I you, lost a little tiny patch of scalp. Too. When I, you know, I, you know, I grew up. Uh, you know, they used to tell you in in, in shop class about you know they, they'd have like posters of like people who are around, well right? they'd they'd have like posters of like hippies you know who are like partially scalped you know they have like you know half of their skull removed because right. they got caught in a drill press but it was only it was only like a year or two years ago that I actually read in the paper that a woman had died at I think MIT uh, because she was working with a drill press and she didn't put her hair back well, leaned over and and. It happened so fast. I mean, I think they f they found her like the next day because you know she was working alone at night. Wow. Um, if if your hair gets caught in a rotating tool, it happens so fast. 
you know, your head gets pulled into the tool. So if it's a table saw or drill press or something like that, I mean, that is totally, that is, that is your ass in right. a millisecond. I'll, Gotta I'll have your you. hair back. Uh, so yeah, um, and um, the other end of it, this is just the last part, um, is when you actually go and actually design uh, a circuit board, uh, there's lots of paperwork to do. And I, I, I do all my board layouts by hand, so I'm very old fashioned. But that uh, die that I showed, that was for Brooklyn, and this is actually the, uh, uh, this is the actual circuit board for Brooklyn. It's a Rev 5 board. Um, and I did this, uh, I did this in ProTel, sort of my uh, standard go-to program. It's, it's antiquated. I don't think anyone even uses ProTel anymore. Uh, but it's single-sided. Um, and that, that is what uh, a hand laid out board looks like. There are no jumpers. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's pretty. Yeah. You, you, you right. feel, and, and also, you know, um, I, I also, um, because I etch my own boards, I like to make sure that I keep as much copper on the board as right, possible. Right. So big ground I saw plane, that too, yeah. yeah, big ground plane. Uh, you got ground plane running through underneath of the op amps there. Uh, oh, it's not oh, on there. You're quick. You started talking, <laughs> so I wanted to catch your expression. Put it back on okay. the sheet there. Yeah. Sorry. I'm so sorry. there's the you know so got ground plane all around. Even got ground plane running underneath of the uh, op amps right. there. You know, you, you, it's a good and idea. You know, it's a show I want to do at some point. Um, in some venue would be about how ground plane and the inductance, how the current follows the path of least inductance, not the least resistance. And your ground plane is, is a big part of that and apertures and things. This is an example of a wiring. This is this is the same draw this is an earlier version, but this is a wiring drawing which basically just shows where all the wiring is gonna go. So when you're actually doing filling uh, you're going to not only want to match the, the components, like here, this basically shows the component numbers, but also you're going to have to do the wiring. And so um, all the, the wiring, the different wire colors, the length of each wire, uh, and where it's going to go to in the, uh, in, the, in the product, you know, where it's going to be attached to, is all in the, the wiring layout. So this is just for wiring. And then, um, you know, your schematic, basic schematic also laid out in ProTel there, the five there. Mm -hmm. so. And which op amps did you use back then? Oh, well, these are, th well, these 386? are, yeah, well, these are 386 based because the, um, my overdrives were all based on 386. Um, is that, is that the quad 308? No, th the, the, no, the 386 is a, it's a, um, single, single supply, um, power amplifier is really what's designed for it, but, um, I had, you know, most of my, uh, uh Fuzz pedals are based on some peculiarities in the 386 that I had discovered oh, yeah? early on. <laughs> well, I, I found out that the 386, if you over, if you overdrive it, the audio input, that it had a very peculiar way of clipping, and that it would saturate very m and give a, a sound very much like when you saturate a, a tube amp. You know, okay. it sort of had a, it would sort so, of give. So it did, right, I was yeah. going to say, it wasn't just a real sharp. Right. It, it might go it, ultra it was, logarithmic, but it still had some it would it would have there. It would have some give to it. Um, uh, guitar players are familiar with, um, you know, overdriving a tube right. amp, that when you start to get to a point of saturation, there's the power supply starts to sort of it's, see, it's, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and so you get some really great compression, not just clipping, but compression as the amplifier tries to kind of keep up. Right. And the 386 can do that under the right conditions, and so um, uh, my signature tone really is based on sort of manipulating that in the 386. But um, as with... Uh, a lot of my effects, um, there's uh, there's different layers. Like this one actually uses four of them, uh, four 386s. Uh, I've actually got a, a driver, and then I'm actually clipping two 386s uh, in parallel because I found that the harmonics uh, would vary from lot to lot. So there was a randomness in uh, production. So I found if uh, if you put two um, to uh, an overdrive them um, in parallel, that the uh, the output of each one will be slightly different. 
So they're modulating each other. Back well, and forth. well, you you would mix you can mix between the two, and, and so um, you would kind of like piano strings or in in a piano they have multiples, right? right exactly. Right. And so you get non-related uh, components adding together. Right. And that's what gives it its yeah, richness. Yeah, you, you get the additive and subtractive right. uh, results of the various harmonics. Yes, and so uh, the, that's one of the signatures of the Brooklyn. That's what makes the. I Brooklyn found work. you in my thirty-five-year-old okay. data book. Here we go. This is the three eighty-six. <laughs> the uh, yeah, here we go. It, you can tell the, the pages are being <laughs> eaten by the acid. Look at the yellow of the pages. Yeah. So there we go. There's a 386 operational amplifier. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this is a, another thing is uh, when even when you get to the point of, um, I gotta clean this up. When you get to the point of actually having um, a circuit board production set up and you are got your designs and your cranking out product, well then you've got another problem which is quality control and you're going to find that the components that you rely on aren't quite so consistent as you would like them to be. Uh, case in point is one of our favorites, the 8038 single generator, um, oh, yeah. which uh, is spec to run nominally around 18 volts, but uh, in the Glacier I use a, an 8038 and, a, um, and I also use it in the Vibutron. And, um, you get down to like nine volts, ten volts. It's really at its bottom of its and, and there operational was no, voltage. There's no making switched uh, supplies or anything like that. But in spite of the noise, you you just wouldn't. Uh, you would just stick with your nine volt. Right. Well, or two nine volt if you wanted to, if you uh, had to, I guess. Well, it's it's a it's it's to be avoided in the pedal business to have a two battery pedal. It's, uh, okay. it's yeah. You really want to. Okay, you don't want one good standards. and one bad one. Well, no, thing. there are standards. You know, there because pedal boards and power supplies are really designed around a single nine volt supply. Okay. So there are certain design rules. Uh, the Glacier actually runs off of an external power supply, um, and it's regulated. But um, but the Vibratron runs off the battery. But the problem was that the, the 8038 signal generator, um, when you're running it at low frequency, at very lo at low operational voltage, you start to run into the great inconsistency in production. So the variations in lots right. and such meant that um, plugging that you couldn't just plug a, a 38 an 8038 into Vibratron board and expect it to work. I, th you had to go through a process of testing those chips to make sure that they would fit, that they were within the right. specs, that they would work. And so this is one of the things that I had to come up with. This is a, uh, this is a, let's switch over to the uh, number two. All right. This is a testing uh, jig just for the 8038. Um, and uh, so this is for testing in the Vibutron. As you can tell, in the Vibutron case, um, there were a couple of adjustments that I had in the design for the biasing and the symmetry, uh, but um, the the signal generators would often be so far out of spec that they couldn't even be dialed in on the uh, the controls that I had and the trim pots on the board. So this is a way of um, testing 8038's pre-production. So actually, I have a signal generator in and uh, um, out for the um, oscilloscope and um, and then I can adjust uh, within the same parameters as would be on the Vibratron board for the biasing and the symmetry and make sure that it'll work in all the waveforms and be at the right frequency in the LFO modes and you can just uh, plug the 8038 in the socket here uh, go through uh, some very quick um, tests and bias it and check the symmetry and if it passed mustard uh, could unplug it and go on to the next one. And um, jigs like this are, uh, become necessary when you're doing production uh, of any kind of volume where you need quality control over a critical component. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of a big pain in the ass, but uh, you know, it's just something you got to do if you're going to make uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, something and need it to work. Yep. And you can tell we're from the same time era just just by the fact I've got an 8038 board myself yeah. here. Well, we were talking about this because the, the 8038 and, this, and, this, and that analog devices chip too, that uh, precision op-amp comparator is uh, right. and, it's another staple. And the 8038, uh, for, for those that don't know, has a square wave, a triangle wave, and a sine wave. Right. And a, f a pretty fair uh, sine wave. 
You it's can pretty get good. It no, like, yeah, it's, it's you can get it to 0.1 or 0.5 THC. It's a very, I think, it's got a very good sine wave actually for, for, for being a chip for a single chip. Yeah, yeah the, there's um, it's got a complex filter in there. And mm -hmm. If you ever looked at the data sheet, you can see it's it's a it's a multi it's, just, do, 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 right. it's a multi yeah it's a multi stage filter. So it's uh, it's one of the best probably the best um, function generator on one chip oh, I, that I you could that, get. Yeah. I mean, the only thing, I mean, Wienbridge oscillators are the best for sine wave, um, but um, for pra practically all other applications, 8038, was, it was the workhorse standard right. before it was discontinued, of course. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it discontinued years ago. I got mine off eBay you know, yeah, for this thing. Yeah, so, yeah I love the 8038. Yeah, they, they, there are certain chips, I mean, the 555 is... You, people talk about it a lot it's sort of legendary but yeah. but there are other chips like the 633 and the 8038 that are <clears throat> just as ubiquitous you know like in real analog design uh that yeah. people don't really uh, talk about so much okay. but uh yeah i guess that the, the last thing from my end is you know so let's say that you actually have your boards you've got your drilling station you've got your drill dies you've got your quality control but now you got to go and you got to make all these boards and you want to make them yourself you don't want to send them out to some house to get them filled up and populated you want to do your own population you want to do your own soldering your own wiring well because you're a masochist because, because you're into quality baby <laughs> it's <laughs> ah, the only way to do quality, it yeah. it's the only way Finally to do it the shirt says it all sounds swell it ain't an accident you know so what do you do? What do you do if you've got to make a bajillion boards all by yourself? Um, what do you do, Bill? What do you do? Oh, you sit by yourself. <laughs> yeah. Coffee. Check. Yeah. Now what? Uh, a jig. <laughs> ah, you need a special tool. You need something super special. You need something totally crazy, bonkers, insane. Oh, a big coffee pot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the magic of editing. Bring. What do you have here? Okay, so this is uh, a board. Uh, this is a, a filling tool. It's for PCB filling and populating and wiring, um, and it's, it's a, an assembly jig. It's an, you could call That's, it that. You okay. could call it anything you want. Um, don't really have a name for it, but it allows you to to set um, lots of boards at the same time. These are your boards. Uh, which ones are these? These are uh, these are an earlier version of the uh, internet radio thing that I was showing you with the display and stuff. Okay, so this is so a. It's got a little bit of surface mount, a little bit of through hole. So this is the this would be the component side. These aren't really filled, but the idea of uh, a rig like this is it allows you to um, assemble boards uh, in mass by by hand by um, holding all the components in place and allowing you to solder them and they're not going to travel around. You know, for through-hole stuff, this is the way it was done. You would put the boards in here, component side up, and then you'd fill all the boards. You put all your resistors in, you put your ICs in, you put your caps in, blah, blah, blah. You trim off the leads so they're not really long, and you'd populate the boards, all of them. And then, take this uh, top here, and this gets snapped down in place. And then whew, roll it around and boom. And then this is the solder side. And this foam pad is up against the top side, the component side. Keeps everything tight. Um, Even resistors and right. yeah, small it's a, components. It's a cushy foam, so you know it would um, keeps uh, caps and right. everything. If you have um, components that are much higher, you have to set the backing. You know, you, you can set how much it compresses. So if you have, like a transformer on there, you'll do that uh, after, yeah, yeah, and then you'll you know have uh, less pressure. So in, with this, you would still do all your resistors or caps first, and then the, right. do another run of bigger components. Yeah, I would I would layer up from uh, resistors. Just because it couldn't push on the small components as tight if there was a big one. Right. Um, as a rule, you would do the lowest to the highest, right. you know, do resistors and diodes first, and then do IC, ICs, and then transistors, then capacitors, and then, you know, and big caps uh, right. last. Um, but and also for wiring, that something like this is, it, you, you really wouldn't think about it unless you're actually doing a lot of boards, but wiring circuit boards is very, very hard to do if you don't have a tool like this. If you've ever tried to put 20 or 30 wires on a board and solder them, not one at a time, but like all at the same time, uh, you'll know what I mean. Uh, 
trying to keep wires uh, in a th through the holes. Right. So you know, uh, and then flip the board over, and they all fall out. Well, what this does is that you would insert all the wires, um, and then when you put the foam on, it actually holds the holds all the wires down. So you flip it over and you'd see all the wires sticking out here. You solder them all, clip them all, and then they're done. Yep. Yep. So, yep. but yeah, it's the... In, in the early day before, um, um, for companies that couldn't afford like the auto insertion tools, the uh, there was one I saw where you'd have your parts bins here and you'd have this laid out and a laser would go point to the parts bin and then go to the two holes that it would be and then you do it and press a button and go down and do the next one so it's just trying to you still had to do the work but it was trying to take out the the putting the wrong part in the wrong hole so it's thing. basically robotic assembly with the human being the, the robot. robot yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You're, right here, you're basically re you're basically replacing the brain of the assembler but not the body right right it's like a cyborging yeah, your because assembler. You know, if you've worked in in production it, it eight hours of doing and Obviously, with this, where you can do the same part six times rather than one part, one part, one part. Right. That's, that's part well, of the. What I would do is. It, the, that's the uh, way it assists the quality. What you got? What you got? This is what I was going to show is like when you're doing this kind of work, that's what these uh, sheets are for. Like, um, like when you're doing a assembly like this, I, I would have like a sheet like this, you know, which is like the wiring sheet or the assembly sheet, like right next to the well, the boards, so that you're always you're always looking at the reference sheet. Even if you've made thousands of the boards, yeah. you're always you always have it posted right next to the to to the station, so that you're always making sure that all the wires are the right color, the right length, and that all the components are where right. they say That's they why are. Why pilots have checklists even exactly th thousands it, of times. Yeah, redundancy and constantly rechecking, rechecking. Uh, and even then, you know, you still have the occasional mistake. Right. So, but um, but you know, by having the right tools, the right processes, you you eliminate, as as you were saying earlier, you know, you eliminate the error down to a point where you actually do have production. Right. So and, and you're trying not to do um, quality assurance by inspection. You're trying to do quality assurance by build process. Well, both actually. I mean, well, in my case, it was always both because in the process, right. you're always mulling over the work. So the, you're constantly checking for errors. I mean, when you make your own circuit boards, you can have microscopic little filaments of copper that mm -hmm. don't get etched through because a piece of dust landed on the board when it was being etched or whatever. And you might find very late in the game, just you've looked at the board a hundred times, and at the very end, you'll see something that doesn't quite look right, and you'll find a defect, and you'll right. have to correct it. So there's always a process of weeding yeah, out. Yeah, and in production, that's the, the people that know that, it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're putting twice as many inspectors on, it won't fix the problem. We need to fix the, you know, where those wires are coming from, for example. So, cool. So cool. So there you go. That's, uh, that's your whole thing. And I wasn't lying about the dies. It's, it's actually... Uh, a so whole box. This is the. <laughs> this is basically an entire company in one box. This is this is every uh, every die for every Frantone pedal. Uh, so this is kind of like uh, for the uh, United States Mint. This is all the, the <laughs> yeah. die for making the money. Yeah, right? this, this is worth its weight in palladium, <laughs> to be sure. So uh, yeah, and you know, all handmade. So you know, who knows how many hours are in that? So oh. Oh, very cool. And, and how long have you had this? Uh, a long time. I I had several of them. This is the last one I have left. So, um, but the I've never found uh, another one to replace it. So I'm, they're expensive. I mean, yeah. you know, they're like five hundred bucks to well, get them. Well, yeah, I'm size. pretty sure that um, I got this second hand. I I had I had a few of them that were all the same size, and I think they were all custom built. Um, from a smaller facility, so I imagine things like this were pretty much made to order. I don't think you could get it out of catalog, but you can you can make up something like this yourself yeah. um, with uh, you know some oh, even making plywood jigs in, in a big company is they have yeah the tool tool department does yeah. That. yeah. Well, I'll be bringing in more of my little tools and jigs yeah, and cool. stuff because the, there's lots of them. Uh, as we get into different themes and production, because right. uh, there are different jigs that I've built for for drilling, machining cases, for doing silk screening, uh, all the different levels of production. Right. You know, but so uh, but these are some of the cooler 
assembly tools for PCBs. Right. So for small and medium uh, run. Okay. Well, this is a you know this is for you know medium to larger run. I mean, I I was doing hundreds of boards, uh, you know, a month. Uh, so, um, you know, for if you're doing anything more than a dozen pieces, you you know you do start to need tools like this to right. to be able to do anything consistent. You know, uh, time quantity becomes an issue if you've got a schedule. Right. You know, <laughs> just remember my version of large is. I oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's th that's why we're we're you know, we're we're not talking about wave soldering or you yeah. know we're talking about hand soldering here. So, um, but this is about the limits for hand assembly. I mean, uh, after, after after this, after yeah, this, uh, you're just you're you're in, you're doing too many to do by hand. Yeah. Um, well, very cool. I was thinking uh, next show we could do something on uh, maybe showing wire wrap or something. Show like yeah. in, in the lab how to make something. You know, where in the lab you wouldn't use those little silly breadboards and call it done, but you could certainly use wire wrap and it'll work as good as a circuit board most of the time. Mostly work most of the time would be how I'd say that. There's a lot of mostlys in that. There sense. is, yeah, because, <laughs> you know, when you're doing a, a prototype, you know, there's, there's um, trade-offs, but um, during that time you hope to learn the trade-offs. That's how, you know, how you introduce yourself to the circuit and stuff. I used to kind of not like it when, um, if, if a circuit fired right up, one, I'd be suspicious I'm not testing it right. But the second is, I always, when you're debugging a circuit, that makes you look at everything and you go, oh, look at the noise on that or something. If a circuit fires right up, now you have to just go in there looking for things that might be wrong also. So I always liked it if there was a bug or a two in there. It, it made me a little more honest about looking at everything. Head off the next problem. So... <laughs> So one thing I did want to plug here real quick is if you're a fan of Hackaday, you may have noticed uh, I did a video where we're looking to get um, some people to help me. And basically, as you know, I've lost something. And what we're looking at is uh, I'm, I'm no good mechanically. I'm just not. I'm an electronics engineer. So uh, what we want to do is get some mechanical people together, maybe some electronics, some bionics, and, you know, uh, and, and uh, see if we can work up a prosthesis. We can make him, him, we can rebuild him. We can make him better than he was. Better, and stronger, And see, if you know what she's faster. talking about, then you're a dinosaur. If right? you know about what I'm talking about, you may be a dinosaur. Which, he could pick up whole engine blocks. How come his pelvis never crushed or his legs, right? So, oh. um, so anyways, I just want to plug that real quick. I'll, we'll be announcing more here, but we're going to start a project under project, um, hackaday.io. So I wanted to throw it out here, too, in case y'all... Uh, might might want to participate in helping me get my feeler back. So sounds cool. All right. So cool. Okay. Oh yeah. Well, Go you ahead. know, um, yeah. I showed uh, well, I showed this episode the um, the boards for the Brooklyn. This is actually the finished product. This that's what a Brooklyn looks like. Yeah, the uh, the Brooklyn Overdrive. So you know. Um, that's I, a nice paint job on there too. Yeah. Well, this is this is actually one of the rejects, but. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, I can see. It yeah, it looks shiny. But yeah, I you know I did the painting, did the silk screening, uh, drilling. Uh, the only th one of the few things I outsourced was the knobs because you know making your own phenolic knobs <laughs> is not really recommended. But uh, but I did have them custom made. Uh, they're actually yeah, I, my blue, last, blue bakelite. I tried to make phenolic a while back, and I just I got the recipe wrong. I ended up with bakelite. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh. I hate when that happens when so. you're when you're looking for a real phenolic and end up with bakelite. Yeah. So, uh, but so. anyway, I guess that just about wraps right. it up for this episode yeah. of the Dinosaur Den number and four. Number four. See, you keep track of that. I, I don't. I, it's, uh, I'm gonna I, run I out of fingers. Not. I'm gonna run out of fingers and I won't be able to. Be because, before or after me? Uh, uh, slightly after. before. Well, I don't. Well, I've got a bad thumb. I I won't use it, so, so. Uh, we'll be even. All right. <laughs> well, next time we might, we may, we could, we might. Uh, talk about um, assembly in the uh, prototyping phase again because we like to bounce around a little bit and if we do that if you don't know what this is we'll talk about it next time and show you what this is cool yeah and um, you know send us your suggestions and uh, on the forum the on the website yeah, the, the new website has a new bulletin board we, so, we should uh, start some topics there yeah and uh, it's at uh, franandbill.com uh, mm. And uh, and also we have a 
uh, P.O. Box, so if you've got stuff you want to send us, if you've got some dino gear that you think should be part of our show, that we'll show it off here on the Dinosaur yeah, Den. Give you a plug. Send it to our uh, uh, mailing address, which is uh, also on the website. So, um, yeah. Someday we'll come up with swag and we could then turn yeah. to the swag, but well, we don't we, have you know, it if, I'll tell you, if we get up to like 5,000 subscribers, we'll start making swag. Yeah. So. Mouse pads or coffee cups or ah, you, your choice. You know, you, you know. Aspirin dispensers. That's <laughs> real dinosaur in there. <laughs> <laughs> Who takes aspirin anymore? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless you're having a heart attack. It's, yeah, well, that's a little have, too late. Having done CPR, we we don't yeah. think about trying to force an aspirin. Oh, okay. So. All right. Well, it's great having you here, and uh, happy whatever holiday. To yeah. You. This is Labor happy, Day. Uh, yeah, we're laboring. Yeah, right. <laughs> Take care. Bye.